Hi, I'm Jay. I shoot these in practical pistol competition, and I'm going to share with you every trick I've learned in three years of questing for the lightest trigger I can manage. So by these, I mean Ruger double action revolvers in the second generation pattern. So that's your GP100s, your Super GP100s, your Super Red Hawks, and your SP101s. The LCR and Red Hawk are both different in their operating mechanisms. I don't know those well enough to give you much in the way of guidance. So we'll get started with that tune-up in a bit, but there is a little bit of housekeeping I want to cover first. So number one, if this video survives the YouTube censors, there will be handy chapter markers in the uh, playback bar, so you can follow along and jump to the more important, the most important part at any given time. I'm working on a text and pictures version too, in article form, because articles are better than videos, but this is already a big project and that's more on top of it, so I don't know when that's going to be done. Keep an eye on the video description. I'll put a link there when it's ready. So number two, we're going to start this video with a complete disassembly so you can see what's inside the gun and what happens in the action when you pull the trigger. After that, we'll look at what you can do to tidy up that trigger. Uh, we'll do that in stages too. So we'll start with the easy stuff and move on to the harder ones, the harder tasks. You can go as far as you want or stop wherever. And finally, we'll put everything back together again. There are a couple of places where that's a little fraught, so I'll show you some tips and tricks to make sure everything lines up just right. So number three, this 10 millimeter match champion is new to me and needs to be brought up to the same standard as my USPSA guns if I'm going to use it in any competitions this year. So by way of demonstration, I'll be starting with this gun that's basically in factory configuration and bringing it down to as close to my other guns as I can get. So you'll get to follow along with me as I'm going through the process again, now for the third time. So finally, you're going to need some tools, and I've got them right here for you. Some screwdrivers. I use uh, this set from Weaver. You don't really need super fancy ones, though. We're not doing very much beyond just taking off grips. Two steel punches. You'll want a 1 16th and a 3 30 seconds. You can probably get away with two 1 16th, but the 3 30 seconds one makes it a little bit easier to guide pins in in a couple of places. So, I mean, really, you've probably got these two already. If not, just get a set. Some files. I have this mill file I got from the local hardware store for material removal on non-hardened parts and uh, places where I need to take a lot off. There aren't a ton of those though, so I also have this set of diamond files and multiple grits from Amazon. I'll put a link to that in the description because they're handy to have. So not only will they work on hardened parts like the hammer, they will also, the, the finer grits allow you to kind of pre-polish things where the dimensions aren't quite so critical. A trigger scale. This spring-loaded model from Wheeler works just fine for me. You don't need a huge amount of range. We've got some tip, uh, some tricks we can do to measure heavier triggers than the eight pounds this goes up to with this eight pound scale. It's also useful for determining hammer fall weight and the weight of your trigger reset springs, which you'll want to be able to test more specifically than what the label on the package says. You'll need some very light abrasives. I use this set of 1,000 to 2,500 grit sandpaper from 3M, and a tube of flits. So the sandpaper, which I'll put a link to in the description, is for polishing automotive paint. So the sandpaper is easier to use, I find, than the set of fine grit stones that I have on my shelf of gunsmithing parts, and is also a lot harder to take material off of a surface with. And a lot of the surfaces we're going to be polishing are very dimension critical. So the easier it is to get them to a mirror shine without the risk of removing any metal from them, the better. If your gun is relatively recent and you have the new style firing pin bushing, you'll want this wrench from Bowen Classic Arms. I'm also told that a number 14 snake eye or spanner screwdriver will do the trick, although I haven't tried one of those to verify that for you. If you don't know what firing pin retention setup you have, whether it's the new style or the old style bushing, uh, pull the hammer back uh, on your gun and look at the back of the frame. If it looks like this, then you have the new model. If you aren't planning on pulling the trigger tens of thousands of times in dry fire, and you don't care about getting the absolute lightest trigger pull possible, you can probably skip the wrench because you only need it to take the firing pin and firing pin spring out. So, although the firing pin spring is a wear item, and it's nice to be able to do that yourself if it comes to it, you probably won't need to if you're not planning on using the guns as heavily as I do. For reference material, I'd recommend Iowegian's Book of Knowledge, and that's Iowegian spelled like this, which I presume means resident of Iowa. It's free, and if you can't find a copy online, I'll maybe put a link in the description below. I also recommend this. So that's uh, Jerry Kuhnhausen's shop manual for the Ruger double action revolvers. 
sharp-eyed viewers might note that it is for the Security 6 series as opposed to the, uh, the second generation guns. But I find that although that's true, the relationship between the GP100s and the earlier Ruger revolvers is close enough that a lot of what the book discusses still applies. So the parts may look a little bit different, but the way they function in the firing sequence is similar enough that the book will give you a good understanding of what's going on. Actually, I don't recommend this one, this DVD from the American Gunsmithing Institution. Um, it is about the Ruger Cheap 100s, but the, uh, the Kuhnhausen manual is just so much more informative. I actually, all of my understanding about the way the hammer dog works in the trigger pull and what it does as far as hitchiness or smoothness uh, to Kuhnhausen. Speaking of hammer dogs, let's move on to the fourth and final item on our list of housekeeping tasks. That's parts, where to get them, and how to get your gun serviced. So Ruger will generally send you wear items, springs, other small parts free of charge, as long as you own one of their guns. I haven't paid for one in my time of owning any of these pistols. Now, what they won't do is give you parts in the parts diagram in your manual that are marked as requires factory fitting. Those parts include a bunch of things that you might want if you need to, say, retime a gun that's beginning to wear out. So for those kinds of things, Numrich comes through. Uh, you can buy Pauls from them, and Pauls are generally enough to retime a gun that's come out of time, unless the, uh, unless the ratchet on the ejector is really, really worn, and I haven't come across one of those yet myself. So they also sell hammer dogs and trigger plungers, which you might go through a couple of over the course of following this video. They, they both make a big difference to uh, trigger feel and timing in various ways, and the dimensions are changing are very small, so it's easy to get them wrong. I kind of keep a bag of them in my box of parts in case I happen to make a mistake when I'm working on a new gun. So Ruger is very good about fixing broken guns, and hasn't charged me for any of the trips mine have had to take to the factory. Not a ton, just tidying up various things as they came into my ownership. That said, they're also very diligent about restoring those guns to factory condition. So they once took a Bowen rough country rear sight off of one of my guns and replaced it with the factory adjustable sight. They did at least return the Bowen one, but it was a little bit surprising to see the factory sight on the gun when it came back. Whenever I have a need for factory service, then I will take basically all the custom parts off, that is any lightened springs, any trigger shims that aren't from the factory, and uh, keep those at home so as to give them as little to do as possible in their quest to get everything back to factory spec. So with that out of the way, we can get started on the meat of this video. We'll fire up CamBot over here, and you can join me down at the workbench. Let's start with a baseline number. The 10mm match champion here is pretty much in factory spec, and this Super GP100 is the best I've done on a gun so far. With the trusty spring-based trigger scale, I like to measure from the bottom tip of the trigger. It's less accurate in terms of what you actually feel when you pull the trigger, but because of the leverage, it amplifies the range of the scale a little bit more. So you can get a meaningful number for heavier triggers instead of just, yep, that's more than 8 pounds. So let's uh, take a crack at it real quick and see what we get. So the match champions, a little bit more than 8 pounds. Which, you know, not bad. 8.5 or 9. So the Super GP here. Give that a pull. That pulls at a nice 5.5 or so. In terms of actual feel, I'd say the uh, Super GP is maybe 6.5 or 7 pounds tops, and the Match Champion is probably in the 12 to 14 range, so we've got a lot of room to make these better. So gloves on, and let's get to work. I'm not going to go too much into detail on disassembling down to the main subassemblies, because there are other better sources for that. Uh, just start with the grips. If, like my 357, you have OEM style grips, uh, you know, you've got the cross screw instead of the one at the bottom. And if you have Hogue grips, like on the Match Champion here, you've got the shackle, whereas the uh, OEM grips don't need that. Back. Bring it out. <laughs> 
So first, take the hammer out. Okay. Many of your uh, competition guns from the factory will have hammer shims in there, so make sure you don't leave any inside. And now this will look a lot better. And we are down to the main trigger unit. So pull the trigger a bit, you can take the transfer bar out, set that aside. Uh, you've got the rest of the trigger assembly here. So I am going to try and use the official Ruger names for things as much as I can. I've got my manual open next to me, and I will be referencing that, and I'll do my best, but if I make any mistakes, uh, you get what you pay for, I guess. So once you've got the trigger guard out, you'll want to take your 1 16th punch and use that to push out the trigger guard latch pin once you've pushed the trigger guard latch plunger in against a hard surface. So I'm going to pop that down on the bench here. I'm going to push in, just knock that pin out, and go. I've got that taken down. So we'll put the trigger assembly right about here. So there's the latch uh, plunger, there's the latch pin, plunger pin. Pull the trigger, that'll knock the return spring out. If you give it a good pat, that'll put the, uh, the return spring plunger thing. The trigger link plunger, according to the manual, which goes uh, this way in with the point facing toward the spring and the latch plunger. So like that. So once you're that far, you can take the trigger assembly out by just pushing the trigger uh, the trigger pin out through the guard. Put that there. And that just lifts out of the frame. So you know, here you have the trigger assembly, which includes the trigger plunger, this arrowhead shaped piece inside. We'll take a closer look at that later on because it's important. Uh, and the pawl here on the outside. So the pawl, just kind of wiggle off. Keep your thumb over the back of it because there is a spring-loaded uh, plunger under there, and it'll go flying if you let it. So pawl comes out. There's that plunger, plunger by the pawl, and there is the trigger plunger itself. So this piece, uh, this piece controls a number of parts of the timing and also has an impact on how strong a reset spring you need. Okay, so back to the trigger guard over here, uh, just kind of wiggle the cylinder latch off of its peg. Give it a couple of taps. There is another spring-loaded plunger uh, deep within the uh, deep within the trigger guard assembly. There. There we go. So you'll notice you've got two spring-loaded plungers of very similar size. The one with the shorter plunger head goes to the pawl, and the one with the longer plunger head goes to the cylinder latch. So that's the trigger guard assembly fully torn down. We'll move on to the cylinder, the trigger assembly fully torn down. We'll move on to the cylinder itself now. So this comes down a little bit, but not a ton compared to what we've done to the trigger guard here. So the cylinder is held on to the uh, crane by ball bearings on the inside. The way you get it off, there is, in this hole, there is a spring-loaded pin that's retained in the uh, in the crane itself, you'll push down on. That frees this pin to come out this side, so you'll push it from this side. This is a very much a two-handed job, so you'll put your 1 16th punch in the retaining pin hole. Give it a little push, not all the way to the bottom, because that'll lock, in, uh, lock it in the other direction. So, medium in, uh, 3 30 seconds punch in the retaining pin hole, or in the other pin hole you'll get this little sort of fat-headed guy there. We'll set him aside. Now this uh, can be easy or hard, depending on the gun. The 3.27 slides right off. The 9mm takes a bit of a yank. I haven't tried this one yet, so we'll see. Once you've taken the 
ejector rod and front latch out of the cylinder, then it should either slide it off or take a bit of a yank to get over the ball bearing. So this one looks like it's going to be a bit of a yank. And there is a, another plunger in there too, but that's a short one that goes with that. Little tap will get it free. You've got the crane and the cylinder. And that's about as far as you need to take the gun down in any ordinary circumstance. So we've got the gun fully apart now. We can begin to talk about the timing and what the action does when you pull the trigger. So while everything is out of the gun, this is a good time to give you a quick rundown of which of the four little spring and plunger assemblies go with which part, since there are a lot of them and they're pretty easy to confuse. So there is a medium plunger on a long spring and that goes to the pawl. There's a long plunger on a long spring that goes to the cylinder latch. There is a medium plunger on a short to medium spring that goes to the hammer dog. And lastly, the short plunger on the short spring goes to the front latch here. Let's talk the cylinder locking and unlocking sequence. So I've got four parts here on the table for you. Well, five, I guess. We've got the cylinder latch and its spring. We have the trigger plunger. We have the pawl plunger and its spring and the pawl itself. Now I'll pull the trigger once on my out of the gun unit so you can kind of get a top side look at it if I can get the thing at the camera. To break that down, what happens when you begin to pull the trigger is that the trigger plunger, the nose of it begins to move down as the entire trigger unit rotates in that direction. So kind of like that. So what that does is it pulls the nose of the, the nose of the trigger plunger down across this ledge on the end of the cylinder latch. So that brings the cylinder latch down and unlocks the cylinder. At the same time, the pawl is moving up which engages the notch on the ratchet and begins to turn the cylinder. So after a little bit of time has passed, the uh, nose of the trigger plunger will slip off of this ledge and that will allow the cylinder latch to pop back up under the force of its spring. So what that does is it allows the cylinder to relock. The, uh, the cylinder latch will then be riding on the cylinder and when it comes to the next notch, it'll uh, uh, snap back into place and hold the cylinder in place as the gun fires. So you've kind of got the whole thing in this arrangement as the gun fires. Uh, the trigger's pulled all the way back, so this whole assembly is tilted forward. So as the gun begins to reset, what happens is the pawl and plunger come back down the trigger, latch comes back down, which means that this sloped surface on the front of the trigger plunger is now sliding over this surface on the bottom of the cylinder. So as the trigger reset spring is turning the trigger this turning the trigger assembly this way, this spring on the pawl plunger is being compressed as the trigger plunger slides backwards against that surface. Eventually what'll happen is the nose of the trigger plunger will slip over the top of this and then we'll be back into our starting arrangement. So as the trigger is returning, this, uh, the cylinder latch here is actually being pushed down a little bit by the fact that it's resting in the cylinder notch. It doesn't come all the way up to this maximum upper extension uh, when it's in the gun. So if you push down a little bit, you'll hear the, the trigger plunger snap back across the lip there. So one of the limiting factors on how much you can lighten the trigger return spring on these Rugers is this piece. You want the knows of it to be relatively short. You want the, which means when you pull the trigger, the, uh, the cylinder latch will pop up pretty quickly after the uh, cylinder begins to turn. You can modify that some to take a little bit of nose off of it. We'll go into that a little bit if I need to when I work on the reset of this gun a little bit deeper into the video. Let's talk briefly about what happens with the trigger and hammer when you pull that trigger. So this is actually one of the parts of the gun I'm least sure about what's actually going on because, you know, it's a Ruger, there's no side plate to take off. You can't look at what's going on when you actually do it. But from cutaway videos I've seen and from my own experimentation, this is what I think is going on. So you start with the 
hammer and trigger in something like disassembly. So you'll notice that the hammer dog here uh, coming out of the face of the hammer is resting on this upper surface, which I'm going to call the double action hook for lack of a better term. It's not labeled in the manual. So the double action sear, this angled surface on the bottom of that double action hook is not contacting the bottom of the hammer yet. We'll call that the double action bearing down there. So as you begin pulling the trigger, the only contact that's actually happening is between the hammer dog and the curved upper surface of that double action hook. Now a little bit into the trigger pull, you'll see the uh, the two parts kind of come together. So the double action sear is now riding on the double action bearing, and the hammer dog is riding on the double action hook. So you continue to pull the trigger. Eventually the uh, hammer dog comes off of the double action hook altogether, and the double action sear and bearing are the only two surfaces engaged. So you finish pulling the trigger, the, uh, the double action sear slips off of the uh, double action bearing, the hammer comes forward, and the trigger resets. So one thing that happens during that process is the double action hook pushes the hammer dog back in and slips past it. So the hammer dog being uh, free to move is an important part of a light trigger because, again, that determines how much trigger reset spring you need. And uh, the trigger reset spring in these guns is a major contributor to the trigger pull weight. There's one last thing we need to cover before we bust out the abrasives. What is our goal with tuning up a gun exactly? As I see it, there are two parts to it. Number one, totally independent of pull weight, we want a smooth trigger pull. We want to take out any of the grit or binding in the trigger. It should feel like two perfectly smooth steel blocks gliding past each other on a film of oil, and that's attainable with these guns. Second, we want a light pull. We'll get a little bit of weight reduction uh, going after that first goal by reducing internal friction between the parts, but most of the reduced trigger pull weight is going to come from reduced springs. Exactly how light depends on what you want to do with the gun. So reducing the trigger pull spring, the trigger return spring rather, is basically free until the gun stops resetting or you find the reset too sluggish. Reducing the hammer spring, on the other hand, is going to impact ignition pretty quickly. So a lot of what we do at intermediate levels and beyond is going to circle around maintaining that ignition power with a lighter spring. The goal there is to dump as much power into the firing pin as possible, which means dumping as little as possible into friction, into the frame, into various springs opposing the operation of the hammer. To determine how much energy is in a hammer spring before any losses at the end of the hammer arc, I like to measure hammer fall weight. It's a better way to tell what a given spring is doing than what it says in the little baggie you get it in. The variation in a spring measurement as you get from, say, Wolf or M Carbo or, wh or whoever is kind of on the order of 10 to 20 percent. So an 11 pound spring might be a 10 pound spring or a 12 pound spring as far as the actual uh, overall weight. So Hammerfall isolates, uh, well, Hammerfall, you basically measure the spring in the gun so you know exactly what you're getting with a given spring in the given gun. I'll demo that real quick here because it's a good technique to know. So you start by pulling back the trigger. Uh, if you've got a single action notch on your hammer still, it's much easier, but you can do this double action to just pull the trigger to uh, get it back. So you want to put the tip of your trigger scale as far up as possible on the hammer. So on a Ruger, that is right under the hammer step that contacts the frame. So you pull the trigger then, let the hammer go forward, and keep the trigger pinned to the back of the frame, the back of the trigger guard. So the next thing you do, you line up the trigger scale with the barrel, uh, pull until you see the hammer begin to lift, and then the reading on the trigger scale is your hammer fall weight. So this is a little under two and a half pounds. So because hammer fall weight isn't really directly comparable between two different guns, it depends on a lot of uh, things like what shims you have in, how much polishing you've done. I'm not going to give you baseline numbers to aim for uh, right now. I will at the end of the video. I'll tell you what my various guns run and how well they work. Um, but it's something you've got to discover for yourself by experimentation. So keep all that in mind, but first things first, grab your abrasives and let's get to polishing. Because this would be a very long video if I showed you the entire process of polishing every part I'm going to polish, I'm going to kind of give you a general overview first and elide the process for each individual part. So my polishing station is here. I have four grits of sandpaper, 
uh, 1,000, 1,500, 2,000, and 2,500. I typically will go down those first for most parts, except for the ones that are extremely uh, finely toleranced. And I'll finish off with a hit of flits. So I'll kind of have a, uh, a patch on which I load a part with flits, a part for kind of the gross polishing, and a part for the fine polishing to take the remainder of the flits residue off. That's pretty much the process. There's just a lot of it to do. So let's jump into it. We'll start with a nice easy part. One you can't really mess up too badly because none of the tolerances are all that critical. That is the transfer bar. So this uh, slides up. Um, when you pull the trigger, pull uh, slides up into place so that the uh, the hammer hits it, it hits the firing pin. When it's not in position, the hammer doesn't even reach the firing pin. So that's your drop safety in a Ruger revolver. The uh, places to polish, you want both of the facing surfaces of it, that will let you run a lighter reset spring as it will uh, slip down uh, in front of the hammer more readily if it's a smoother part. You want to polish the outside uh, here where it contacts the frame, and also the inside here where it contacts the uh, side of the trigger unit. I wet sand everything it's easier to see what's going on with the part, and it uh, seems to make the sandpaper last longer, too. For parts with strange angles, like this transfer bar, I will come to the end of my bench and uh, just hang it off the edge so I can get to whatever weird spot I need to get to. In between stages, I like to give it a good wipe off to see how uh, it's coming along, what tool marks remain on the part, and whether I need to go further. A good bit of tail, you just kind of you'll get a sense for the smoothness of it running a patch or running a punch over it. And I think this one needs a little bit more work on the thousand grit before I go deeper. Another trick: uh, I like to number the back of my sandpaper with sharpies, so I do not lose track of them when I uh, move them around like this. Another option for these strangely shaped parts is to get them in the vise and uh, use pressure against the vise to run the sandpaper back and forth. I'll demo that on one where it's a little bit more important than the inside of the, the transfer bar here. Okay, so on to the polish itself. Uh, I, I do like flits. I'm kind of any very lightly abrasive polish will do. Uh, so like I said, I'll get a dab on one patch and kind of use that as my starting point and then sort of work down patch by patch until it's clean. Start with the easy surface here. If your patches have a little bit of texture, this is easier. Take that pound residue off, and you've got a very shiny, very smooth surface there, so I can get it to catch the light in the camera. There you have it, a slipped up transfer bar. So some of these surfaces are mirror smooth. You'll notice some of them still have some surface imperfections, like on the face of it here. So that is okay. They're still much slicker now than they are out of the box, and you can tidy them up further if you feel like you're still feeling them, but really you probably won't even at, uh, at this level of polish. The next part on the list is the cylinder latch. So the first thing you want to polish is the top surface here where it rides on the cylinder. Get that to just about a mirror shine. You can use all four grits of sandpaper, no problem. The next two surfaces are a little hard to see. Let's see if I can get this properly held. So here, on this, on the top surface of this ledge, that's where the nose of the trigger plunger pushes down to unlock the cylinder. You'll feel a little bit of grit there if that's not polished. So again, you can use all four grits and uh, the flits. Lastly, we'll turn this over real quick. So this bottom shelf is where the trigger plunger pushes as it resets. So the the uh, the tilted surface on the nose of the trigger plunger rides upward on this. So again, get that to a mirror shine too. This is a part where the vise helps, uh, since the surfaces are so small, so I'm going to get it 
lined up in there. Clamp it down and I can work on those surfaces a little bit more easily. The trick for working on very small areas with the sandpaper is to take a small punch, wrap the tip of it in the sandpaper so you get a nice fold, and you can use that fold then as your uh, sanding surface. If you've got a wide piece like I have here, it might be easier to get a smaller one off of your sheet of sandpaper, but I'm running pretty low on sandpaper, so I'm going to do it the hard way. So some smaller patches are handy for polishing work on small parts in the vise. A little bit of a little bit of polish on the patch. Just kind of give it a stretch and you can use your thumbs to apply pressure to get the polish in where it needs to go. And kind of the same thing as with larger patches you work from a dirty one up to a clean one. And of course for, again, tiny spots like the, like the front ledge, the front ledge on that cylinder latch, you can wrap the, uh, wrap that patch around a punch to really get in those tight spaces. There is your tidied up cylinder latch. So the important surface, like I said, the top where it rides on the cylinder, the top of this front ledge where the trigger plunger will pull it down, and the bottom of that ledge where the trigger plunger will ride during trigger reset. The next part up is the pawl, and the pawl is jam-packed with critical dimensions. So the width of it, both here at the back, uh, here at the back, and at the front, have a major impact on cylinder timing. Since uh, so the pawl sits in the trigger, the trigger kind of sort of floats freely in the frame compared to the cylinder. So the width of the pawl is important because uh, it'll press against the window that it pokes through the frame in and that'll determine its side-to-side -side placement. So you can't take any uh, any serious width off or else you'll risk uh, having a cylinder that doesn't fully lock by the time the hammer falls. Uh, the height of the pawl of this kind of shiny part will determine when the cylinder begins to move. So, oops, knock the camera over there. So if the pawl is too tall, uh, the cylinder will begin to move before the cylinder latch is fully unlocked. If the pawl is too short, then the cylinder latch might pop back up into the same notch it was trying to leave and the cylinder will lock. So you can't take any off the top and bottom either. So what I'm going to do, this is a flitz only part for me. I'm going to polish the inside surface here, uh, in particular this tip, because that's where it engages the ratchet on the cylinder. I'll polish the top for the same reason. In particular, the cylinder slides, the ratchet on the cylinder rather slides over this ledge here. So making that part of it nice and shiny and smooth will help with uh, the feel as the cylinder transitions from being pushed up by the top to being pushed in by the side. I'm also going to polish this outside surface because as I said that pokes through the frame, it rides on the uh, pawl window in the recoil shield and making that smooth will give you uh, less grit. You have it a nicely shined up pawl. So this one, uh, looking at it, it may benefit from some additional work later on. It's got a couple of nicks and burrs along the top edge there. It's kind of tough to see with the camera. You've got a decent look there. So this may, like I said, benefit from work on the sandpaper later on. But again, because it is so critical dimension-wise and because those dimensions, the, like the changes you make are pretty small to fit one, I will look at that later on once I've determined, once I've got the gun back together and uh, 
I can then see if it needs it. So if you have a trigger that is particularly, um, there's a particularly large distinction between when the pawl is pushing up, when it's pushing up and when the pawl is pushing in, you may be able to take some of that out by rounding off that edge where the transition between uh, up and in happens on the ratchet. But again, that's uh, something something to be embarked on carefully and with the understanding that you might need to go buy a new pawl and figure out how to fit it if you do so. Before we move on to polish the trigger plunger here, we should take a look at the gun to see how much margin of error we have in handling it. So if I take a look at uh, my 357 here, as I pull the trigger, you'll notice that the cylinder latch pulls down and then a little while later pops up against the cylinder again. So this gun has a pretty large margin of error. You see the cylinder latch contacts the cylinder probably two or three uh, cylinder latch tip widths away from the notch. So if you take the uh, if you take the the width of that tip there on the cylinder latch, you can use that as a unit of measure. If it's closer than uh, it was closer than one cylinder tip width away from the notch, then you should cylinder latch tip width away from the notch. Then you should be very careful about polishing. If you've got a uh, room like this, you can be a little bit freer with it. So on the match champion, I have plenty of room. I've tested that before we got started. So I am going to go with the full uh, the full sandpaper and flitz polish here. If you do that test and you find that you don't have a lot of room to test, you don't have a lot of room for error, you should be cautious with the sandpaper and prefer just the flitz. A quick refresher on the functions of the trigger plunger before we begin. So the length of the nose in this direction determines how long the cylinder latch will stay unlocked for. Uh, so as you're pulling the uh, as you're pulling the trigger, this tilts downward and engages the shelf on the cylinder latch. Uh, if the nose is shorter, then the uh, then it'll pull down past that ledge faster, and the cylinder latch will come up sooner. The depth of this undercut on the nose of the trigger plunger determines when the cylinder latch will begin to move down. So the further up the body that is, the later the the later the gun will unlock. If you have a uh, very shallow notch, it'll begin to unlock very soon. And lastly, there is one final place that uh, is fit from the factory on this part, I think, at least. I've seen it filed before. So the depth of this notch uh, in that direction toward the front of the part that determines, in part, how much reset force you need on the trigger. On the trigger plunger, I like to polish just about everything. So I'll polish the slanted surface because that uh, rides on the bottom of the cylinder latch during trigger reset. I'll polish the bottom of the nose because that's what pulls down on the cylinder latch when you're pulling the, when you're pulling the trigger. And I'll actually polish both sides too because it sits in the trigger assembly in such a way that it might rub on either one. And uh, smoother there is better. So there's your chromed up trigger plunger. And it's actually in a lot of places slick enough that it's difficult to hold with gloves, which is a good place to be. Like I said, that's a pretty important part and it does a lot of things and making it smooth in all the important places will make a difference. Next up is the trigger proper. There are a couple of places we want to hit with polish on this. So number one, and probably most importantly for double action pulling, the top surface of the double action hook here, almost as important, the double action sear. So that's this surface in here on the bottom of the uh, the bottom of that hook. We don't want to change any angles there, but we can go with sandpaper. There's uh, enough margin of error in there to uh, to work that way. I also like to hit the just the sides of the trigger unit generally. Uh, that'll help it turn more freely in the trigger guard, and we're going to put shims in there anyway later on. So if you take some material off, there's it's not a big deal. 
the transfer bar sits in that hole. A little bit of flitz on both and a couple of rotations will help lap them together for a smoother pull there too. Got a nice shiny surface now on the double action hook and the double action sear, and the sides of the hammer are very smooth to the touch. Or the sides of the trigger, rather, are very smooth to the touch. That is all of our trigger parts nicely polished up and ready to go back into the trigger guard unit. But before we do that, there are a couple of things we should tidy up on the trigger guard unit itself. So number one, you should find a 13 64ths drill bit and uh, run that in to the um, to the tunnel where the uh, trigger return spring goes. So that's typically pretty roughly machined, and you can clean it up by hand by just running that drill bit in back and forth a little. Uh, you don't want to drill any deeper, so if you're uh, if the drill bit's coming up the far end, you want to pull that back a bit, and you also don't want to run uh, to do this with a power tool. Just do it by hand. All right, so that is much smoother now on the inside. You can put that drill bit aside. The other thing you should do to the trigger guard unit when you have it out of the gun and fully depopulated is clean up the inside surfaces here. So uh, this one and this one where the trigger unit sits against when it's in the gun. Uh, that'll again help with the free turning of that, which will give you better trigger pull feel as well as probably better reset. This is a good job to use the vise for. You can kind of vise it in that way on the tail and pull sandpaper uh, or a very light stone through. And we'll start putting the trigger assembly back together. We're going to come back a little bit later on and put some shims in, but for now we'll just get it back together and see how the gun feels when we've finished the rest of it too. So first step, take the uh, Long plunger and long spring, put that into the hole in the very front. That is your cylinder latch plunger. So we'll kind of pop that in. Push it down with a punch. Be careful because it is under tension. Push it toward the latch, and then uh, as you push the latch in, it'll just kind of naturally slip under the ledge where it's supposed to go. That little drop of oil uh, on the pin it turns on will serve you in good stead but wipe away any excess. I have found through experience that the Rugers like to be run pretty dry when they're tuned up to this degree. All right, so that turns like it's supposed to. Next thing we need to do is put the trigger assembly back together. So we'll start by getting our trigger plunger, putting the nose in under the crossbar here and pushing it forward. It should sit in like that. So tap it so it falls all the way forward. Take the uh, medium plunger on the long spring and put that in the hole at the back of the trigger assembly. That is where the paw is going to go back in. So this you can do with fingers. Get the tip of the plunger under your fingernail, push it in, put and kind of wiggle the paw into place to take over from it. Um, to take over from your thumb to hold the, uh, the plunger and spring in place. So in the end, you should have the pawl pushing on that spring and the back of the trigger plunger pushing against it from the other side. All right, we'll get the trigger back in place. So the tail on the trigger goes into the tunnel to push on the trigger return spring. So make sure you get that right. You can't put it back uh, later on. So tail goes in, trigger goes into place, uh, six, well, one sixteenth punch works great as a pilot here, so we'll kind of line everything up and then we'll push it back out with the trigger pin. Right. Again, a pretty tricky part because you're working against a couple of different springs. Alright, so that's in place. Okay, so Next part in is the trigger return spring plunger on this side. Uh, Iowegian's Book of Knowledge recommends a drop of oil on the, on the body of that. Just give it a little spin to coat it evenly. Drop that into place. Spring goes on top of it. Cylinder latch plunger 
goes in the end. If you hold it like this between your fingers, uh, you can take your 1 16th punch and uh, use that to lock it in before you put the, uh, the paper in later on. So, that goes in thusly. Slide the pin in, and then you've got a trigger assembly that you can at least function test. Very smooth. Once you, like I just did, work out which pin goes to the uh, hammer and which goes to the cylinder latch over here, uh, you can again use a hard surface to push down on. Oh, I'm gonna get this the right way around. A hard surface to push down on the cylinder latch plunger, and then use the pin to push your pilot pin out. I'm going to do this off camera because it's very finicky and I need the best angle I can get. Right. Once you're most of the way in, you can just push the rest of the way with a punch. Uh, places to oil here, you can put a drop of it there on the tip of the trigger plunger and work the trigger a few times and that'll get the oil everywhere it needs to be. So that is a trigger assembly ready to go back into the gun. Now that the trigger is back in the gun, we can move on to the hammer and to its associated parts. So before we start with the polishing, there is one modification I've taken to making to all my hammers, which I will explain right now. So the hammer, of course, sits in this machined channel in the back of the frame. Now that being a machine channel, it's possible the corners aren't always going to be perfectly square, just by the difficulties of uh, machining a square shape. So if you take a look at this uh, U I've drawn on this little notepad, you see the corners are slightly rounded, and that's what can happen to these. So to avoid the corners of the hammer interacting with the corners, uh, with these potentially rounded corners in the channel in the frame, I've taken to uh, turning in the front of the hammer somewhat. So if you look real close there, you see that it's got a kind of trapezoidal shape. Uh, it doesn't take a lot, I just kind of draw a line down the side of the hammer with a sharpie and file gently inward until I get to that shape. So I'm going to do that first, and we'll come back here in a second. So I don't take this too seriously, I'll just draw a nice straight line down and color it in, and essentially pick an angle with the file and erase that line with it. There you go. Nice, easy, turned-in nose hammer. So there are a few other surfaces I want to give some attention to. Uh, foremost is the double-action bearing surface down here on the bottom of the hammer. There's also the area around the uh, pivot pin hole. I like to give that a nice polish because that's where the, uh, the shims ride, and giving them a smoother rotation will mean less friction, which will mean uh, more hammer energy. So we'll get started on those. Although the double action bearing surface here on the hammer is a critical dimension, the hammer is hard enough that you can work it with sandpaper as well as polish without uh, risk of changing dimensions. So I'm going to do that next. A nice mirror shine on that. So if you're interested in cleaning up the single action pull, the single action sear is this little notch on the front of the hammer, and it engages the uh, tip of the double action hook on the trigger itself. I don't really bother with that on account of being a double action shooter 99% of the time, so uh, I leave you with that information. You can do with it what you will. Next on the list is the hammer dog. Now this uh, protrudes from the nose of the hammer. The surface that, cha that sets that protrusion is this one right here. It's on the uh, back top of the hammer dog in its orientation when it comes out of the hammer. So we don't want to change that at all. As far as I can tell from looking at various uh, hammer dogs in various guns, none of these surfaces are factory fit. The only one the factory changes is this one, and I'll show you how that works deeper into the video when we take some off the nose of the hammer probably. But for now, what we're going to polish is this, uh, these bottom surfaces. Uh, so everything from about here 
to here is implicated in the trigger pull in various ways. So we're going to get the uh, the bearing surface is nice and slicked up. And then this part of the front, you can see the wear mark there actually, as the trigger as the trigger resets, the double action hook rubs against this surface. So the smoother this is, the better. Now I also do the sides of this because it sits in the hammer and because the trigger has to push it backward when it's resetting, smoother sides means less friction, means lighter reset. End result, one very shiny hammer dog. So we can put the hammer back together for now. We're going to come back to this later and add some shims. Uh, We'll do springs and shims in a kind of its own section of the video. So this is another spring-loaded part you're putting back together, and as such, it is a good candidate for a pilot punch. One often overlooked part is the hammer pivot. It's got a pretty rough surface, so we're going to give it the full treatment from sandpaper all the way down to polish. This is another one that's really easy in the vise. You just uh, clamp it like that and you've got access to the top part you need. I don't necessarily mind leaving a tiny bit of uh, polishing compound residue on here because that just lets it and the hammer kind of lap themselves together a little better. So one of the things you'll find is that this trigger job improves substantially after the first time you clean it. You may notice a little bit of grit as the remaining polishing compound works its way out of the system and smooths out surfaces that are in contact for the first time. So pull the trigger 100, 200 times, uh, wipe everything down, give it a very fresh, a fresh, very light coat of oil, and see what you think then. We have one part left before we can put everything back in the gun and see the fruits of our polish job for the first time, and that part is the mainspring strut. So, we're going to polish the uh, ball head where it sits against the hammer, and we're going to polish the mating surface on the hammer too. Now we're also going to polish something I don't see people talking about very often, and that is the part of the strut that contacts the mainspring seat here. So it's kind of tough to see, but the front of the mainspring strut rides against that surface in the, uh, in the mainspring seat when the trigger's pulled. So this is actually a critical surface to the feel of a Ruger trigger, and they come from the factory pretty rough a lot of the time. It's one of the things that you'll typically wear in if you dry fire a lot, but we can shortcut that and get it better by using some tools. So I'm going to take this apart first. The best way I've found to do that is to get it on a hard surface, hold the spring down with your dominant hand, and then let it release uh, with your non-dominant hand. So when you put this back together, remember the flat side of the mainspring strut goes to the back of the seat uh, with the wider um, the wider prongs. But getting into the uh, mainspring strut seat on the hammer is kind of tricky. I have had luck rolling up sandpaper and kind of getting in that way or simply using the top of the mainspring strut as a uh, carrier for lapping compound to get, uh, to get right in there. I will do the lapping compound trick here, just kind of dip the head of the strut into the flits and let's see, line it up in the way that it's going to go and uh, just kind of Get it in there. This is one of the places where a Ruger will squeak if you've got rough surfaces or poorly lubricated surfaces on other ones. So again, this is one of those places where I'm not too concerned about leaving a little bit 
of polishing compound residue. It'll just make the trigger better and better as time goes by. All right, reassembling the mainspring strut. The best way I've found is, again, to take the spring in your dominant hand, uh, squish it down, and use your left, your non-dominant hand rather, to drop the uh, seat on and put a punch through to hold it in place. So this is a factory strength spring, which I haven't done in a while. Oh, they're big, they're heavy. But that was going to go sky high momentarily, so I'm going to bring this over to a part of the bench where I've got better leverage. That I might need standard strength, or make my hands for this for better grip. In Iowegian's Book of Knowledge, there's a trick you can do with a dinner fork to uh, push the clip down in this configuration, but I don't have any forks I'm allowed to do that with, so... So once you get it most of the way there, you can kind of get both hands on it, then push that punch through. So one of the only places that I oil my guns heavily is right here around the strut in the strut seat. I am not convinced it's possible to overdo it in this area, again, because there's so much spring tension on it, and there's a lot of leverage advantage going back the trigger. So I think that is everything polished. Let's put stuff back together. In terms of trigger tuning, there's not actually anything to do on the cylinder assembly, so we're going to put that back together now and get it back in the gun. We're going to start with a little bit of cleaning. The first thing you can do is take a totally dry patch and uh, tidy up the bearing race inside the cylinder on which the crane run on, on which it rides on the crane. So. I like to get one, just kind of push it around with the edge of, of the end of a punch. Again, this is uh, a very dry patch. There's no need to get any oil in there because it's already on the uh, on the ball bearings. So that done. Give the tube of the crane a wipe and get a little tiny bit of oil on a patch. And wipe that down. All right, so that goes into the cylinder. The spring for the front latch goes into its slot in the crane. Having gotten that plunger into place, the next part that goes into the ejector rod, the short slot that goes all the way to the bottom faces out. And if you look into the uh, down into the barrel of the crane, I guess, you can see the uh, the rod that goes to the ejector star on the back of the cylinder. So the way this works is the cutout on the, sh uh, the short slot on the ejector rod fits around that. So you kind of tilt it into place, and then we'll slot the front latch in. So the rounded end points in toward the rest of the gun, and the flat end engages the long notch on the outside, or on the inside, rather, of the ejector rod. So that pops in like that. You might have to give it a little bit of a pop because what you're doing when you do that is re-engaging the ball bearings that lock the uh, that lock the cylinder onto the crane. And as you might recall from taking the gun apart, uh, this one's a little bit sticky. It's okay to give it, like I said, a little bit of a pop to get it back into place. The next step is to get the front latch pivot pin, this fat-headed guy you may recall from disassembly, back into the gun. So this piece has to go past that spring-loaded retaining pin, as well as the spring-loaded front latch. So it is much easier if you use a punch as a pilot. So get the 1 16th punch in to push that lock pin, that retaining pin back in, and then kind of get the other punch started, and then use your finger to uh, line it up. Okay, so I'm going to actually take the retaining pin out there 
and get it through the uh, through the front latch first. So now it's through the front latch, I can pop the uh, other punch back in to push the retaining pin in, and that should give me a better angle at getting the whole thing through. Yeah, so now I've got my 3.30 seconds punch held in place by the retaining pin, the spring-loaded one in that hole, and everything else is properly engaged. So the trick now is just to use that punch, like I said, as a pilot. So get the cylinder on a nice flat surface. You'll want to push that retaining pin in a little bit with your 1 16th, and then use the front latch pivot pin to drive the 3 30 seconds punch out. Now everything's back together uh, and functional. So give it a quick test. You know, your um, ejector should work, your front latch should pivot on the uh, the newly installed pivot pin. I'm actually sure it's 100% uh, fully in, so I'm going to give it a little push that latch pin again. And okay, I guess that's uh, it's fully in. All right, so then you've got a cylinder assembly back together. You just slip that. So the uh, the barrel of the crane goes into the appropriate hole on the gun. This is another place where a drop of oil won't go amiss. Just get a little wipe around with a patch, and back into the gun. So sticker backing, like a wax paper and a paper on the other side, is a really great tool for pushing trigger shims back in place. I keep a little length of it in my range bag, and I've got... Uh, I've got a piece of it in my screwdriver box as well. A drop of oil in the hole there will seep in around the pivot pin and give you some lubrication in that area, although it's easier to overdo that. You don't want too much because oil is drag above a certain point. So let's get... Going back into the gun, the flat side of the mainspring strut goes to the rear of the, of the griff. Let's, uh, let me get the scale in here. I don't think it's going to be very much lighter, but it does certainly feel a lot smoother. When we started, this gun was at a little over eight pounds, maybe eight and a half or eight and three quarters. We're pulling right at about eight now at the very bottom of the trigger, which given that we haven't actually changed any springs yet, it's a pretty substantial improvement. That brings us to the end of the polishing phase. The next step is going to be replacing springs and adding shims, so let's uh, take a look at those. First up, springs. I'm going to go with what I consider kind of the starting point for a lightened action job, which is to say an 11-pound wolf hammer spring and an 8-pound wolf trigger return spring. We can definitely go lighter on the trigger return spring, and we will later in this video. We might be able to go lighter on the hammer, but that depends on the gun, and we'll save that for a range trip sometime in the future. Already there's maybe half as much weight in the trigger unit itself outside of the gun. The factory reset spring, as I've said, is very, very stiff. That puts us at about 7 pounds on the trigger scale, again measuring from the very tip. So maybe 8 or 9 pounds measuring from, a, or from where you actually pull it, which again is not bad for the amount of work we just did. When I was reassembling the gun just now, I left the factory hammer shims out. That's because in this step we're going to determine what shim thicknesses we actually need. 
Over here, I have the three kinds of shims you can typically get for a Ruger. There are other ones that we're not going to go into in this video. Uh, but regardless, we've got our hammer dog shims, our hammer shims, and our trigger shims. Now the trigger shims we can set aside for the moment because they'll mostly come into play when we're working to get the reset as low as possible. Right now, the eight pound spring from Wolf has plenty of oomph to manage even relatively poorly fit parts. So that leaves us with hammer shims and hammer dog shims. We'll talk quickly about the purpose of each of those uh, once I take the hammer out of the gun. Hammer shims sit between the frame and the hammer, riding here on the sides of the assembly. What they do is prevent the hammer from moving side to side in the frame and keep it from contacting the walls of the frame as it comes forward. So proper thickness of hammer shims will reduce the amount of energy lost to friction between the hammer and the side of the frame. Hammer dog shims sit between the hammer dog here and the inside of the hammer. Now, you may be able to see as I push this back and forth that the hammer dog actually has quite a lot of play uh, as it is. And as I've mentioned a couple of times so far in this video, the hammer dog plays a critical role in determining whether or not there are hitches or binds in two specific parts of the trigger pull. We're coming up now on the time when we'll talk about those, but suffice it to say for the moment, what we want to do is reduce that wiggle as much as we can. Again, without reducing the uh, ability of the hammer dog to move freely. Hammer shims are kind of a Goldilocks situation. So the goal is to have enough hammer shim to keep the hammer centered in the frame and not contacting the sides of it, but not so much hammer shim that you're pinching the hammer between the shims uh, as it's trying to move forward, thus adding the drag you're trying to take away in the first place. So the way you figure out what the right shim thickness is for your gun is using the hammer fall weight measure uh, measurement we talked about way back at the beginning of the video. I've measured the hammer fall on this gun with no shims, that's why I took the factory shims out when I reassembled it last time, and it comes to about two and a half pounds. So I'm going to add shims until I get to a thickness that begins to increase the hammer fall weight. Again, the hammer fall weight is the measurement of the force the hammer falls with, or rather the force it takes to pull the hammer back uh, from its nearly fully forward position. So drag on the hammer will affect that. I'll start with these two orange ones, which are six mils thick. Six mils is also the thickness of the factory hammer shims, but you'll notice that these these ones from triggershims.com have quite a lot more uh, bearing area than the factory ones, and will therefore uh, increase the resistance of the hammer to tilting. The hammer fall weight with those six mil shims remains about two and a half pounds, so I haven't added any hammer fall weight weight, which means I haven't added uh, an appreciable amount of drag. So to determine whether I need to go further, I can do a little Sharpie test. So I'm going to pull the hammer back and basically just color in the sides of the hammer here. Then I'm going to pull the trigger about 50 or 100 times and see if I see any drag marks in the Sharpie. If I do, I'll step up uh, one size in shims. If I don't, then I'll leave it as is. All right, 100 trigger pulls later, and I see zero evidence of dragging on the uh, size of the hammer there. So I'm going to leave those six mil shims as is. Uh, what you'll see, I don't have one ready for you, but you'll basically just see kind of, I'll sketch some in for you. You'll see marks kind of like that, where the drag of the side of the frame cuts into the Sharpie coating. But this one looks like it's good to go, so we'll move on to hammer dog shims now. To determine what size hammer dog shims you need, the easiest tools just to set a feeler gauges, if you push the hammer all the way to one side and then measure the clearance between the hammer dog and the side of the hammer, that'll give you the maximum size shim you could possibly use. You want to leave probably minimally about five mils of clearance because again that part has to move very freely for uh, easy trigger reset. So having uh, 20 mil clearance on this one, the thickest shims I have are only four mils. I'm just going to put in the two four mil shims, one on each side, and leave it at that probably. 
a little bit of wiggle still, but not nearly as much. And a fingertip says that it still moves very freely. So adding hammer dog shims will give you a little bit more trigger consistency because it reduces the uh, angles at which the hammer dog can be offset when it's riding on the trigger hook. A single drop of oil on the side of a hammer will help the trigger shims adhere while they go back into the gun. So I will typically do just one on the side uh, nearest the side the hammer pin goes into, so I can kind of slide it in and get it mostly lined up the first time through. A little skinny punch will center everything for you. As I've said, though, you want to be very careful about getting oil in the hammer pivot area beyond what you absolutely need. The amount of oil you really truly need there is pretty small. You don't want to add drag, like I've said in the past. So we'll pop that chin back in, get it lined up. This will have a very limited impact on trigger pull weight, if it has an impact at all. The thing you're improving here is the consistency of the trigger from pull to pull. You're limiting the number of angles by which parts can be related to one another at the beginning of a trigger pull and therefore reducing the different ways it can go down uh, physically. That brings us to the end of what I would call the basic trigger job. We've polished parts, we have replaced springs, and we've added some shims, but we haven't made any permanent modifications to the gun. That ends now. Everything from here on out, at least as far as the trigger job goes, is going to be permanent changes, things you can't reverse, and things that might require either factory service or fitting more parts if you get them wrong. So continue with me with, a, with that warning, and we'll keep on moving. On to the next topic, which is modifying your hammer for better ignition. There are two schools of thought on this, one of which I am in favor of, another one which I am neither in favor of nor against. So we'll start with that second one first, since it's a little bit more interesting, and it's one that is a lot more common across revolver models. And that is bobbing the hammer or otherwise lightening it. So I have this uh, lightened hammer here that I did myself for my Super Red Hawk style guns. I took this spur off with an angle grinder and profiled the rest of it with a Dremel carbide uh, cutting bit. So that's one way to get that done on the Ruger hammers with their notoriously hard steel. The reason I'm neither for nor against this is by analogy to an actual hammer. So this is a shape that has a lot of angular momentum here at the top. It's a heavy mass on a uh, relatively light stick. So even when it's not moving very fast, it's got a lot of momentum at the far end because that's where all the mass is. So if you bob a hammer, you kind of turn it into something uh, like this, where the mass is much further down and you've got a light extension at the top. Now it is moving faster because the spring is pushing it faster, there's not as much mass there, but I'm not sure what the relative effect of the decreased angular momentum from the lightened hammer is versus the increased speed. So it may make a difference, it probably does make a positive, positive difference just because so many trigger jobs involve lightened hammers across many different kinds of guns, but I can't recommend it on a scientific basis uh, for that reason. The other modification is Ruger specific and involves reducing the height of the hammer step here at the top of the hammer, that is the amount it protrudes from the face. So what that does is it allows the hammer to deliver more of its energy to the transfer bar and then to the firing pin and less to the frame. So if you look at this fully assembled Ruger, I'll pull the trigger and let go of it. If you look very closely at the hammer, you'll see that it doesn't move. So what that means is that the hammer is resting on the hammer step resting with the hammer step against the frame. The transfer bar is like takes the impact, but it's not what's stopping the hammer. So there is some energy going into the frame, even in a tuned up gun like that. You want to reduce that amount without eliminating it, uh, without eliminating it altogether. Something that I think I've found, I can't be 100% sure about this, is that taking too much off the hammer step will really shorten the lifespan of your firing pin spring. As you're dumping more energy in, it's moving faster forward. It's compressing the spring more and thereby wearing it out faster. So there's a limit to what you can do to that. The figure given in Iowegian's Book of Knowledge is 20 mils, so I'm going to give that a try on this gun and we'll see what happens in, say, six or eight months. If you 
work in a machine shop, please don't laugh at my primitive marking methods. I've got my calipers here set for 20 mils, so I will just kind of scratch that line in into the sharpie on the top of the hammer, and there's my target. This is a fairly messy process, so I'll take the hammer dog out now to avoid trapping any uh, schmutz in there while I work. Although this job is on the hammer, which is a part that is as hard as woodpecker lips, as I've heard it described by somebody more folksy than myself, I still prefer to use my big file on it. It'll wear out the file faster, but I find it much easier to keep a level surface with this than it is with the diamond files, so that's, uh, that's my reasoning there. Now I'll also sometimes mark the front of the hammer. The, when I'm working on something I want to keep square and true, I'll mark the front of it with a sharpie so I can be sure that I'm filing straight across and not uh, not biased in one direction or the other. Clearly I need to do my gunsmithing tasks on camera more often because that's one of the best lines I've ever filed. So here it is back in the gun. And it seems to work. So one of the ways you can tell you've gone too far is if you pull the trigger and you feel it binding at the beginning of the reset. That's the hammer uh, rubbing against the transfer bar and preventing it from fully from being pulled down by the return spring. You can do two things to fix that. One of them, you can polish the front of the hammer. That will give you less friction and a better uh, less friction and a better chance at resetting. The other one, if that doesn't work, you can very carefully take a little bit of thickness off of the transfer bar itself. Uh, so on relatively coarse sandpaper or on a, say, relatively coarse stone, you can reduce that thickness somewhat uh, all across its length and then polish it back up, and you should be okay. Finally, after an hour of foreshadowing, we've reached the part of the video that is about the hammer dog. The hammer dog can cause one of two flaws in the trigger, depending on whether it's too short or too long. Uh, I'll show you what those flaws are and how to check for them now. So... If you hold the cylinder in your hand to prevent it from turning and pull the trigger. So the hammer moves through a small arc here. If there is a hitch or a bind at this point of the trigger pull, your hammer dog is too short. Unfortunately, that means you need to get a new one and fit that. You can't make them. I guess you could make one longer by, say, putting it on a hard surface and whacking it with a hammer, but I have not yet successfully done that, so uh, I'll leave it to somebody more adventurous than me to give it a try. The second flaw, so you pull the trigger, you wait for that first click, which is the cylinder latch uh, returning to the locked position. Turn the cylinder to the next uh, notch, so now it's locked again, and then hold the cylinder in place again and pull back and forth. Now about here, if there is a hesitation or a, uh, a wall in the trigger, that is a hammer dog that's too long. Uh, this gun actually has that flaw, so we can fix that here. I've noticed that from the factory, Ruger tends to fit these a little bit too short rather than a little bit too long. The way the fitting process works, there's a much bigger window between just right and so short it doesn't work than there is between obviously too long and just a little bit too long. So it's uh, less effort, less uh, headache to get them to the maybe slightly short of, uh, of ideal. So both my Super GPs had that issue. The Match Champion, as I've said, has the slightly too long the slightly too long hammer dog, which means we can fix it uh, without having to get a new part out. Before I go into fitting the hammer dog on the match champion to the match champion, let's take a look at a new part from the factory, well, from Numrich, completely unfit to any gun here on the left, and a part that was fit to the 357 here on the right. So, as I said in a previous segment on the hammer dog, Although these surfaces on the bottom are the ones that interact with the double action hook, the only surface the factory appears to fit is this top one here. So to give you an idea of what's happening there, that sits in the, uh, in the hammer like that. So by taking 
material off of this surface at this angle, you allow the hammer dog to rest further into the uh, further into the hammer, which, because the pivot is offset up here, it reduces the amount it protrudes relative to the uh, double action hook. So that's what we are fitting. I'm going to stack these up for you and take a picture and put that on screen to demonstrate exactly where the difference is. So you can take a look at that and see the amount of material we're changing here. It's a very small difference. I like to use the uh, big mill file for it because it's a little bit less aggressive than the thickest of the diamond files and it's much easier to cut a uh, straight edge with it, for me at least. Uh, again, that nice straight edge is what we want, just like it was on the hammer step. So whatever you need to do to get that uh, clean cut, do that. Here are a few photos to show the difference between a fitted part and an unfitted part. As you could probably tell from those pictures, this is a job that you almost can't be too careful on. So what I'll generally do, I will mark the surface I'm trying to fit. I've got it set in the vise so that uh, the angle of cut I want to make is just above horizontal this way, kind of toward the camera. And what I'm going to do is basically try and cut the Sharpie off from top to bottom. So that's not me eliding any steps for the purposes of the video. I actually just took four passes with a file and I'm going to try it again. It's that precise a job. Now for testing, I may not put all the shims back in the gun. This flaw should still reveal itself whether or not they're there. Since I haven't adjusted my cameras, I'll do this up at chest height so you can see. Here's the click locked. Okay, so it's better, but it's still there. So I'm going to take it uh, take the hammer dog back out and give it one more try. So because because this is just a stop and not a uh, not a part that slides on, on another part, it doesn't need to be polished. You can get it to the right dimensions with the file and just leave it as is. As I said, I did my testing without shims. I'll put the shims back in and give it one more pull just to make sure everything is A-OK. -okay. And again, one more test. So no initial flaw. Locked. Let's see. There's just the tiniest hint of it there, but it might uh, go away over time as the parts wear together. So I'm going to leave it for the time being and call it good enough. People will often pull the triggers on my guns and say, oh, that doesn't feel like a Ruger at all. And I think most commonly the flaws they're thinking of are the flaws caused by the hammer dog. So getting that fit correct goes a long way toward making your trigger better. Between the hammer dog flaws and polishing the mainspring strut, I think you can get these to a very, very smooth trigger pull a lot of the time. And that's what we've done so far. There are some remaining tasks on my list of things to cover, but this is a relatively good stopping point if you don't care about chasing uh, extra light reset, say, or extra light, uh, an extra light hammer spring at the possible cost of having to do a lot more frequent maintenance on your firing pin spring. Those topics are still to come, but let's, uh, let's get the trigger scale out and see where we are.
So right there at the end, you can see we still have a little tiny bit of a gag. But in general, what you see is the trigger pull force rising steadily, hitting a wall about seven or seven and a half, uh, reducing from that wall by maybe half a pound, and then coming back to it to fire the gun. So it's not quite as good as my 9mm, which I'll pull for you in a similar fashion so you can see, which simply increases straight up and breaks. This is the best gun I've done so far, and I'm not quite sure what causes that last 5% of good or bad. Uh, again, as I work on that, I'll let you know uh, in updates. But we've done a pretty good job on the match champion, and if you're interested in getting that trigger pull even later, stay tuned. We've done a little bit of work so far on trigger return, but we can go a whole lot further. A good way to evaluate this, uh, take your trigger scale and just measure the weight of the trigger out of the gun. So, like that. Now with a factory spring, you're going to see a pull in about the 5 to 6 pound range. With the lightest spring that Wolf sells, you'll see a weight in the 3 or 4 pound range. With the springs I'm using in all of my guns, you will see a one and a half pound range. So the reason this is important is because this weight is always in the trigger. I mean, it's here out of the gun, it'll be there in the gun too. This is kind of the minimum your trigger pull can possibly be. With a factory spring, you're talking about five pounds. That's a relatively heavy double action trigger. Well, not maybe relatively heavy, but it's a heavyish amount of trigger weight all by itself. And you can never get below that threshold. So the ideal weight for this, uh, in my opinion, is either as low as the gun can tolerate or as low as you can tolerate. And I find it a whole lot easier to get used to a very, uh, to a less authoritative reset than I do to a 10 pound trigger. So if you want to join me down here at the close-up camera, we'll take a look at some of the things uh, we can tidy up in the trigger job, in the trigger rather, to allow a lighter spring to be used. As I pull the trigger here, pay close attention to the trigger plunger. So there is the nose of the trigger plunger there, resting on the cylinder latch, and there's the body of the trigger plunger. Start to pull the trigger, the nose of the plunger pulls the cylinder latch down, and eventually slips past the front of it. So you pull the, pull the trigger back, the gun fires. As you release the trigger, the angled surface on the front of the trigger plunger contacts the bottom of the, of the cylinder latch there, and as the reset spring forces it forward, the, uh, trigger, print, uh, the trigger plunger compresses the Paul plunger spring behind it. So, as I let go of the trigger, watch the back of the trigger plunger here uh, and see what it does. So it moves back in the direction of the pawl. So what the trigger return spring is doing is pushing the trigger this way. Uh, it is opposed by the force of the uh, pawl plunger spring down in that gap. Uh, as the pawl, uh, as the trigger plunger is pushed backwards by the action of the nose of it acting against the cylinder latch here. So there are a couple of things we can tidy up in this area. Before we go changing the trigger plunger though, we should see if we actually need to. The trigger plunger, cylinder latch, those parts, there's quite a lot of variation in how they come fit from the factory. You might find that your gun will run them just fine, uh, run a very light spring just fine, or you might need to do some tweaking first. So I'll pop a light one in here and we'll see what happens. I'll pull the trigger here and we'll see what we've got. A slightly sluggish reset. Now that's not necessarily a deal breaker and I'll show you a quick test to see if it's worth testing out in the gun. So if you look at the cylinder latch here and the ledge it uh, sits on, the its kind of rotation stop, they make a slightly, uh, an angle that's kind of slightly in that direction, a kind of chevron pointing to the right. So if you push down on the top of the cylinder latch as though it's riding on the cylinder in the gun, and you get the reset before the angle faces the other direction, like it just did there, you're probably going to be okay in the gun. So we'll give it a try in the gun and see what we get. Got it in the gun, and plenty of reset. So a good test in the gun is to let your finger ride the trigger all the way forward. If you still get reset, then you're in good shape. And just for good measure, we'll pop the hammer and spring back in to verify we've got it there.
this is another test where you don't necessarily need to put the hammer shims in. Your the what you're testing doesn't it, it won't be affected by that too much. It is important to do a test in the gun before you declare it fully good, just because as the gun is resetting, the double action hook has to push the hammer dog in. So you've got a little bit of extra force required with the gun fully assembled. So trigger held back, and I will let that out as slow as I can. And again, plenty of reset. If you find that the gun resets if you pull the trigger straight back and let it out straight forward, but doesn't if you apply side pressure to the trigger, it's hard to tell because I'm pushing up from the bottom. But... Yeah, so say so you kind of bear down with your thumb from this side and then carry out that same test. If the gun won't reset in that scenario, you can add some trigger shims, which will help center it more and give you a little bit of tilt resistance. This gun doesn't need them, I'm going to pop them in anyway. I get all of my trigger shims from triggershims.com along with my hammer shims and hammer dog shims too. Uh, Lance Shively there is a great guy and sells a good product. And I'm not being paid to say that, I just generally think it's a business worth supporting. Although if you do want to pay me, Lance, uh, hit me up. This job is another one that's made easier by using by keeping the pin mostly in the assembly, so I will push it out just enough to get a shim in on this side. Drop my shim in place. Center it up and then push the pin back through. No must, no fuss. And get that gun put back together. And for those of you who have a little bit more trouble than I have, I'll bring out a spare trigger plunger and show you a little bit about what you can do to fit it and what you should be careful with. Here is a fresh from the factory trigger plunger. I should warn you that this is a part, again, like the hammer dog, where a little tiny bit of work goes a very long way. If you begin to make modifications to this, you may find yourself having to buy a new one and fit it from scratch. So with that warning in mind, I'll tell you what you can do to reduce the reset force you need. So the first thing, you can cut in the back of it here a little bit. So if you remember the demo of the trigger unit you just saw, the Paul plunger spring pushes against this surface. So if this, is, if this surface is reduced, what that means is that the Paul plunger spring will be more extended at any given point in the trigger plunger's travel, and therefore acting with less force. So the uh, you can do a little bit there to begin with. I haven't tested taking too much off of that to see if there are any other uh, bad effects with the uh, Paul and reset. There might be, so again, be careful there. On the front of the trigger plunger here, you can take a little bit off the nose. The less nose there is, the less uh, distance it has to travel backward to slip back up over the cylinder latch. But if you take too much off of that, then you'll have a cylinder latch that pops back up too early and locks the cylinder before it's begun to turn, which is also bad. The bottom there's not doesn't really make a big difference uh, to this step. That's important for timing the gun from scratch with new parts, but we'll uh, cover that, I think, toward the end of the video, since it's a pretty speculative process for me at this point. Sometime later this year, I hope to have ultralight trigger springs available for sale somewhere. We'll see how that, that goes, uh, especially as I get these guns into regular competition and see how they uh, handle in that context. If all is well, maybe by the middle of the year, if not, and there's more work to do, probably closer to the end. At any rate, if you're interested in embarking on this project beforehand, I have used uh, some various online spring suppliers where you can enter all the various physical characteristics of a spring, like the wire width and the number of coils and the overall width, and that'll get you close enough to start getting some springs yourself and uh, testing them out and seeing what works in your gun. With reset now taken care of, we'll move on to the firing pin and firing pin spring and see what we can do there.
The reason we consider a lightened firing pin spring is because, again, our goal with all of these modifications is to increase the proportion of energy that the hammer delivers to the primer. A lot of it goes into the spring in the stock configuration, making that spring lighter gives you a little bit more primer hit at the moment of impact, at the most important part of the, the cycle. With a lightened firing pin spring, you almost certainly want a lighter hammer spring too. With the hammer step file down and a spring that isn't as well able to resist the uh, the force of the firing pin coming forward, you want to balance. You want you want a balance between ignition and a long lasting firing pin spring. So I'm going to go down to a 10 pound spring in this gun, and we'll see what the trigger pull looks like. Based on my experience, that should be reliable, but if it's not, I've got a trick for you a little bit later on that will help you dial in your hammer fall weight exactly. To get to the firing pin and its spring, you need, you need to take the firing pin bushing out of the frame. Now, on these newer Rugers, it screws in like it does on the LCR. On older ones, there's a pin driven through the side of the frame that holds uh, the bushing in. That bushing comes out from the front. Those older Rugers will have a... so that that pin is usually blended in very well, you might have to like maybe shine a bright light on to see it. I have I don't have any of those myself, so I can't tell you what the trick is to get those out. But know that that's, that's a possibility. These uh, screw-in bushings are typically Loctited in from the factory, so I'm going to give it a little bit of a test with the uh, Bowen Classic Arms wrench here and see if I can get it free before I bust out the torch, but I expect it's going to be a torch thing. Now the wrench has to push the firing pin in, so you really need to hold it down uh, in some fashion to start it turning. So I'm going to give it a couple of taps with the hammer here. Oh, that actually came free already. So if it doesn't, the torch is the trick. Uh, just heat up the firing pin bushing itself to loosen up the Loctite, and then you can probably tap it free again with your wrench. This one happily didn't need it, so I can get right on to showing you the firing pin. Here is your factory ignition system. You've got a firing pin, a firing pin spring, and a bushing. The spring goes over the front of the firing pin, so I can get my fingers away, like so, so it's resting on, uh, against this shelf on the back of it. Now that assembly pops into the bushing like that. Now it's easiest to reinstall it into the gun in uh, if you put it together like this outside. You can kind of uh, well, I don't have an overhead camera on, but I'll show you in a little bit. But anyway, I am not, I'm not actually going to make very much in the way of modification here. You can get an extended firing pin, but I have one, and even set correctly, I didn't really see much of a difference in ignition with it. Uh, I am going to put in a lighter firing pin spring. This is something I hope to have for you in the not-too-distant future as well. It's quite a hard part to find a good replacement for because you want something lighter than the factory spring, which is pretty stiff, but that, something that can also stand up to the uh, extreme environment it's in. So it's you know it's great next to it, detonating primers. Uh, it experiences very high uh, rates of change of force applied to it because the firing pin's coming forward, then getting thrown back by the uh, the round going off. This one works pretty well, but like the trigger reset spring, it's one that I want to test pretty extensively extensively before I start uh, offering them up for sale. If you want again to uh, find one ahead of like ahead of that, you can use that very same method of looking at the physical characteristics of this spring and plugging those into uh, an online spring store's uh, calculator of springs you can buy. I'm going to put this uh, back together now and pop it back into the gun. Before I put stuff back together, I'll typically run a punch round inside just make sure there's no grit or uh, other debris in there that would limit the travel of the firing pin. It's also not a bad practice to give it a little go with the punch. You want this channel to be, again, in, like entirely free of oil and other contaminants. The less there is in there, the smoother the firing pin is going to move. Especially when I use lightened springs, which might be a maintenance item a little bit more frequent than the factory one, I find that 
Loctite is a bit unnecessary. If you just give it a good twist in, it'll come out freely with tapping on with the hammer when you need to replace things, and it won't come loose when you're using the gun. For a defensive gun, I'd recommend Loctiting something in there, although for a defensive gun, I might not even recommend changing the firing pin spring in the first place. So to reassemble, I like to get the firing pin bushing on the wrench, like so, and then guide it into the gun from the bottom. This is easier when I'm not doing it at an angle that you can see, but these are the sacrifices that I make for you. Vertical and vertical, kind of wiggle it. Once you get the bushing mostly in, you can kind of jiggle it around with a finger until you get it lined up with the threads, and then you can uh, screw it in from here. This is another job that's easier in the vise, but I'd have to move my camera if I wanted to get there, so I'm just going to do it the hard way, and I'll be back with you in a second. When you reassemble, you want to remember where the holes for the wrench were in the bushing and make sure you get to about, uh, about that same spot. You also want to check for free movement of the firing pin by pushing it in with a punch, and check for protrusion by looking at the uh, front of the frame. So if you let go of the firing pin and it stays uh, extended, you've got something wrong somewhere in the system. You might have spotted the magnet on my bench alongside the Bowen firing pin wrench. The reason for that is that the, uh, the little bits of drill rod in the Bowen wrench that engage the firing pin bushing are hard but brittle, and if you twist too hard, if you put too much torque on them, you will snap them off. I've snapped off quite a number of them over the years, and uh, I found that a good, strong, magnetic tool picker-upper is a great way to pull the broken bits out of the wrench so you can reuse it. The wrenches from Bowen come with replacement drill rod, and I found that a Dremel with a cutoff wheel is a perfectly adequate tool to cut the, cut the new drill rod to length. You'll get angled surfaces on these, but once you've got the new pieces in, you can just set it up in your vise and use the Dremel to grind them down. Or you can use the right tool if you have it, like, uh, unlike me. 10 pound spring in the gun. Let's take one final look with the trigger scale. Pulling from the bottom. Started to cut through my trigger scale coating there, so get this lined up a little better. Pulling from the bottom of the trigger, that's about five and three quarters pounds. So that's a pretty good, uh, pretty good trigger job on a Ruger. As I dry fire it more, it will wear in and that trigger will improve. But that's about the end of what I've got for this gun. So there are uh, a couple other things I want to cover, but that brings us to the end of the trigger job. In this section of miscellaneous topics, one is a lot bigger than the rest, and that is timing. I don't have enough experience to say whether Paul wear or ratchet wear is more likely to cause a Ruger to come out of time first, but when it happened to me, it was Paul wear. So Numrich will sell you a Paul, and before sending the gun back to Ruger, I thought I'd give fitting one myself a try. And I succeeded. I wrote down what I did, and I'm going to go over it now, but a disclaimer first. I've only done this one time, so it's possible that I got lucky. And I don't really have any desire to muddle through it again uh, on camera, given that I don't have any guns that need to be timed right now. So this will be pure exposition at the moment. If I need to do it again, I'll record it then and uh, show you a video so you can see what I'm doing. I just have to deal with me talking for this part. There are two timing parts you can buy. There's the Paul and the trigger plunger. It's probably easier to fit a Paul to an existing trigger plunger than to fit both at the same time, but because the trigger plunger controls the cylinder latch timing, the uh, Paul controls cylinder rotation timing, and both of those timings have to match for the gun to work. You might have to do both. So we'll start with the Paul. To begin with, uh, if you put a Paul into a trigger unit and then try and put that into a gun with zero fitting, the uh, trigger unit probably won't even fit in. The Paul will kind of impact the side of the frame. So the first thing we need to do is change the amount of forward tilt the Paul has in the trigger unit. So this surface right here is the tilt stop. If you increase the angle here, so kind of bring the back of it down the back of this surface, 
you'll allow the pawl to tilt further forward in the gun, and that will give you, uh, that will let the trigger unit go in. So I've got a full trigger unit here. Uh, so I can get this lined up right. So there you can see that surface. If I push back on the top of the pawl, you kind of get a sense for what that, uh, like what that tilt stop does and how you need to reduce it to make it fit. Before we go any further, you want to polish the outside surface of the pawl as much as you want to. Uh, this is your chance to get it nice and smooth. Once we start changing the actual dimensions, we'll probably not want to polish this anymore. Just because, again, it's a very sensitive dimension. So if you are fitting a new trigger plunger at the same time, leave it off the side for now. Uh, install the pawl in the gun with the old trigger plunger and pull the trigger. So the trigger probably won't pull all the way back. The pawl is too fat and doesn't fit between the frame window on this side and the tooth of the ratchet on the cylinder on this side. So what we want to do is reduce the thickness of the pawl here on basically the, the part of the left inside tip of it that's forward of the main body. So take that down in thickness by a very small degree. Try it on the gun again. Test frequently as you do this. Eventually, as you get close, the trigger will start to pull all the way back, but bind at the end. And you'll know you get it right once you pull the trigger and it tur the cylinder turns freely. Now, since you have the old trigger plunger in, the gun might lock incorrectly. So if you're running to that, what you need to do is pull the trigger a little bit until the cylinder, la until the cylinder latch pulls down, turn the cylinder by hand, and then uh, continue with your testing. So again, once you have it fit correctly, the trigger will pull straight back. You don't need a hammer or springs in the gun for that test, just the trigger unit and the cylinder. Uh, once every chamber is, uh, once the trigger pull is smooth for, for every chamber, then you are done with the pawl for now. Earlier in the video, we talked about fitting a trigger plunger to a gun for minimum reset force. The process here is exactly the same, so I'm not going to repeat myself, but I will talk about the three scenarios you might run into uh, once you fit your new pawl. So the first scenario, and the ideal one, is that the cylinder latch pulls down, the cylinder turns so that the latch clears the notch, then the, uh, the latch pops back up. That's a gun that's correctly timed, you can take that to the bank. Uh, scenario number two is early timing. So the notch, the latch pulls down and then pops back up into the same notch. What that means is that there's not enough nose in the trigger plunger, so you need to start, you need to fit a new one from scratch. So go back to the, uh, go back to the trigger plunger fitting section of the video and start from there. Another possible fix for early timing is to take a little tiny bit more off of the pivot stop here on the back of the pawl. Now what that will do is allow the pawl to pivot a little bit further forward and thus contact the cylinder a little bit earlier and start turning the cylinder a little bit earlier too. So the it, since the, the latch was popping back up into the same notch and the cylinder is now turning earlier, you might get to the point where it'll pop back up onto the uh, surface of the cylinder and not into the notch. So you might fix it that way. Pawls are more expensive than trigger plungers though, so you might just want to go and start with a new trigger plunger. You might also run into late timing where the cylinder turns and then the end of the, the edge of the notch binds on the cylinder latch because the cylinder latch has not yet begun to pull down. The trick for that one, you can slightly retard cylinder timing by taking material off the very top of the pawl. So what that will do is uh, the, cylinder, the pawl comes forward and contacts the cylinder, but it's, it, it doesn't push the ratchet up as early because there's less material here on top. So that might do it for you too. Those are your three scenarios. So you've got perfectly in time, you're good. Uh, early time, you probably need a new trigger plunger. Late time, you can maybe take some off the pawl, or there might be something else that I'm not aware of. So those are your three timing scenarios. Most of the dimensions you can change on these parts will affect more than one aspect of timing. To the extent of my understanding, which, as I've said, is still limited, uh, these are the effects of those changes. The first one is removing material from the pawl's tilt stop here. So what that will do, that will slightly advance cylinder timing because the pawl tilts further forward and contacts the cylinder ratchet earlier. It will also uh, reduce the amount of spring force on the trigger plunger uh, spring because it's tilted further forward and the spring stop then is further back. So what that means is you might slightly reduce, uh, you might slightly advance cylinder latch pop-up relocking because the force opposing the trigger plunger moving backward is lower and it will also slightly reduce uh, required reset force. So changing the, uh, changing the pivot stop there will change both of those timing traits faster than it reduces the required reset force. 
So removing material from the tip of the pawl is the only one of these that doesn't really affect other timing traits. Uh, if you remove material from the inside edge, the cylinder will lock later. If you remove material from the top of the pawl, the cylinder will start turning later without, uh, without respect to other, uh, other characteristics. On the trigger plunger, we've covered this, but it's worth covering again. Removing material from the underside of the nose will uh, retard latch pulldown. So you, if, as you move that further up, it'll take longer for the bottom surface here to contact the ledge on the cylinder latch and begin the unlocking process. So reducing the nose of the plunger here by filing down the top step or even just filing on that part specifically will advance latch pop-up because the uh, latch will slip past, the, rather the plunger will slip past the latch earlier in the cycle. There's less length there to hold it down. So that will also slightly reduce required reset force because again there's uh, less material here to have to push back up past the uh, past the cylinder latch during trigger reset. A more vertical front face here might be better for reset, but I haven't really tested that enough to say for sure. So removing material from the front of the cut here at the back of the trigger plunger will reduce the spring force on it and therefore probably slightly reduce required reset force and slightly advance latch pop-up. You don't need a lot here. It'll, uh, it changes pretty quick. So there's no way to make latch pop-up happen later beyond fitting a new trigger plunger, so be very careful about that dimension. It's kind of a pain to test, but it's still better to test than to have to start over again. Following these steps should give you a properly timed gun. At least it did for me. Um, if it doesn't, you might have worn out the ratchet, or the ratchet teeth might be unevenly cut. I haven't worn out a ratchet yet myself, and I've pulled the trigger a lot of times on these guns, but I presume it's possible. It's also possible that I missed some crucial step here in the process and ended up just getting lucky. I don't think I have. It seems pretty sensible the way I've laid this out, especially if you follow this process in this order. Uh, but again, even, even if I'm wrong, the factory will sort it out for you. Uh, just be prepared to polish a bunch of parts when you get the gun back. I said I'd give you some representative hammerfall weights, so here we are. On the large frame guns, so the Super Red Hawk or the Super GP100, an 11 pound spring pulled about two and a half to two and three quarters pounds for me for hammerfall, and a 10 pound spring pulled about two to two and a quarter. On the normal size frame, uh, GP100, the match champion I have here, an 11 pound spring pulled about 2.3 to 2.5, and a 10 pound spring pulled about one and three quarters to just over two. Now, that, of course, that's because the uh, GP100 hammer is shorter than the Red Hawk hammer, so there's less uh, leverage on the, on the trigger scale at the, at the tip of it. You can use M5 washers as spacers, so those have a little bit of thickness to them and will give you an ounce or two of additional hammer fall for every one you stack on the main spring strut between the spring and the seat. It's a little tricky to get them in, but if you're very close to a reliable gun, that might give you the reliability you need without having to buy more springs to find a slightly heavier one or go up a whole, uh, go up a whole weight of spring. This is a very quick one. The 10 millimeter match champion head spaces on the case mouth, like you'd expect for a semi-auto cartridge. Now that works fine for 10, but if you're shooting 40, uh, what head spaces the cartridge is the moon clip. The 10 millimeter moon clips from the factory for these guns are pretty skinny. They rely on, again, the case mouth to get the head spacing right. So they're sized for ease of use and for maximum fit. If you don't care about a tool-free moon clip, TK Custom will sell you a 50 mil thick one, which you will absolutely need a tool to get cartridges into but it will also hold the cartridge in just the right spot relative to the recoil shield and the firing pin, so you may see better reliability on a 10 millimeter gun in those cases. In the process of switching to Hogue rubber for the 2023 season, but I've, I'm still fond of the Ruger OEM style grips. I appreciate the uh, chunkiness and profile of them. The thing about the Hogues is that they tell you a little bit more about where your hand is on the draw. The OEM grips might not actually be the best fit for all guns, however. So if you look through the screw hole here, and this is another one that's going to be very hard for me to get on camera for you, but if you look through the grip screw hole as I pull the trigger, you might be able to see the main spring strut moving past it. So all of my uh, large frame guns have taken a little bit of fitting to make the OEM style grips work, uh, work right. And that fitting takes the shape of removing a little bit of material from the front of the bottom of the main spring strut. So that allows the strut to slide down past the grip screw, which is kind of right about here. 
on my match champion, however, there actually I wasn't able to get uh, I wasn't able to get that fit correct before I felt like I was taking too much off of the uh, the mainspring strut. So if it if you get a little hitch or bind in the trigger, you can't diagnose, and it goes away when you take the grips off. And you're using this OEM style of grip with the uh, with the through screw to hold them together. That might be your problem. You can try this fitting thing, or you can switch to something like the Hogue with the uh, mono with the the shackle on the bottom that a single screw goes into. The GP100 and the large frame guns, the Super GP and the Super Red Hawk, share an awful lot of parts. The only ones that I can tell by the eye are different are the ones that are related to the different size of the cylinder. So that is the hammer, you've got to stretch up further, the transfer bar, and the pawl. As far as I can tell, I'm pretty sure the rest are all interchangeable from frame size to frame size. Don't take that as gospel, but you might be able to get away with buying spare parts for one, uh, for one size of gun if you've got the other. Neither one of my 9mm Super GP100s was factory new when it came to my possession, so the first time I saw this transfer bar, I wasn't sure if it was a factory part or a third-party thing. It might still be a third-party thing, but I've now seen it uh, out of the box on two 9mm Super GPs, so I'm going to assume maybe it is a factory part. So the lightened one here on the left is what came in the 9mm, and this one came in my 357, and was also what Ruger sent me when I asked for a spare part for one of the 9mm guns. So I can see how the lightened part, and it is substantially lighter just in my hands here, would be, would be better for ignition since there's less mass for the hammer to get moving, and therefore more energy remaining to go into the firing pin. So that said, on a gun with a hammer da uh, filed down hammer step, um, I broke that lightened transfer bar here at the neck after just maybe a thousand or two trigger pulls in dry fire. So the second 9mm Super GP here doesn't have a filed down hammer step, so I'm going to leave the lightened uh, the light and transfer bar in and see if that makes a difference in ignition reliability. If it does, it wouldn't be very hard to reproduce that profile on a full fat transfer bar with a Dremel and maybe some judicious filing. If that seems like it's the right course to take, I will let you know. To replace the cylinder release, you'll need a very weird screwdriver bit. So this one is 25 mils thick at the tip and 85 mils wide. I couldn't find anything even close to that size stock, so I found one that was the right thickness on Amazon and uh, dremeled it down to the right width. First, break the gun down to a bare frame and unscrew the cylinder release pivot here in the frame. So that is Loctited in. If it gives you trouble, hit it with a soldering iron or something to loosen up the, uh, loosen up the Loctite. This is a factory fit part, and Ruger will not sell you spares, so be careful getting it out. You don't want to bend it. Once you have the cylinder release pivot out of the gun, you want to take a punch and gently push out from the inside. The reason we go out from the inside is if you look right in there, you can probably see the nose of the spring-loaded plunger that holds the cylinder catch in the open position when the cylinder's out of the gun. So if that goes too far inward, it'll get caught in the channel uh, in which the latch pivot rides, and that's no good. That'll get the yeah, that'll get things all kind of locked up in there. So you want to, again, very carefully push it out from the inside and remove it. Then you can take that spring-loaded plunger out and pop it into the new part. These extended ones are nice and easy to drop in because there's a lot more room to get purchase on them. So just kind of slide that into place. Got to compress that plunger a little bit against the nose. And you're good to go. And you can run that uh, the pivot back in and screw it together. So I'll show you real quick what happens if you get it wrong taking the uh, taking the old one out. So I'll put that into place. I will push in cautiously from the front here and over to the side. So I did spend I don't know five minutes off camera just now trying to wiggle that back into place. If it gets locked up, locked up to the point where you can't push it around anymore. Take your uh, take your one sixteenth punch and run it up the pivot hole, and then wiggle the latch from the inside with one of your bigger punches, and that will get to the point where you're uh, back to where you started with the cylinder catch free to move, and you able to take it out again with the more cautious push from the inside approach. The cylinder release pivot is another part I don't really bother to Loctite, even though it is Loctited from the factory. I find that just giving, giving it a good tighten into its position will 
keep it plenty in place for competition purposes. Test for function real quick. It should, uh, if you pull it out, it should push against the spring slightly. If you let go, the spring should push it back in so that the uh, the little nose of it here is visible in the recoil shield. There's one part of the trigger pull where my match champion is not quite to the same standard as my first 9mm Super GP, and that is right about here. So if you pull the trigger a little bit, let the cylinder unlock and start to turn, then hold it in place in between two notches and pull back and forth, you'll see the cylinder latch moving up and down. There's a bit of a wall right there, just before the cylinder latch pulls down. Now, I'm not totally sure what that is, but I suspect it just comes down to dry fire. This gun has had the trigger pulled an awful lot more times, and the spring that holds the, uh, the spring that opposes the cylinder latch's movement is much more worn in on this one. Now there is also a slight difference in geometry on the ejector star, uh, on the ratchet rather, between the nine millimeter gun, or the, rather the eight round guns and the six round ones. So as you can see, the teeth on this ratchet are quite fat, and if I pop open the nine millimeter here. The teeth are much skinnier and have a slightly different profile. So they're slanted very early in their travel here, and they are slanted quite late on this, at least as far as where the uh, where the teeth are when the paw picks up uh, picks up the ratchet. So one thing you can do to tidy this up: the top surface of the paw here, the top corner where it interacts with the latch. If you want, you can file that slightly to round it off. You don't want to change the thickness or the height, just take the sharp edge off of the corner there. That may give you better feel as the uh, as the Paul transitions from lifting the cylinder from the bottom to pushing it from the side. That seemed to help a little bit for my 10 millimeter, but I think the real improvement is just going to be pulling the trigger about 10,000 times to loosen up that spring that holds the cylinder latch in place. Lubrication. My feeling is that too little is better than too much. A dry gun may be a little bit gritty, a gun that's too wet, uh, the oil will put drag on your action components and may cause misfires if you've got a very sensitive competition tune. I do break that rule in four places though, so I have a little dropper bottle of hops here that I use. It's got a needle applicator to keep the oil right where I want it. The first place on putting the gun back together is the nose of the trigger plunger here, so right where it contacts the cylinder latch. That's a critical part, and a tiny bit of oil there will help smooth your reset out too. The next two are on the hammer, so I'll put one here on the mainspring strut seat on the hammer, and I'll put a drop in the hammer pivot hole here on the hammer as well as I'm pushing the pin back through, which will help it turn freely. And the last place is the, the front of the mainspring strut in the gun. That is an as-much-as-you-like kind of place. I said hops before, and I generally prefer a thin oil to a grease, again on the theory that a thin oil is less viscous and will still lubricate without putting as much drag on your action parts. Well, I didn't expect this to run for about two hours, but I suppose I had more to say than I thought I did. I hope you found it informative, and that it helps you if you embark on the process of tuning up a Ruger of your own. If you run into trouble, drop me a comment or suggest a correction. I'm like I said multiple times through this video, I'm kind of exploring relatively unknown territory here, given the paucity of gunsmithing references for these uh, second-generation Ruger pistols. Like I, said, I hope this serves as a good introduction to that field. If you're, if you're interested in supporting me beyond subscribing to the channel, I put a link to my website in the description. You can buy my competition moon clip carriers there, and that's where I'll put up any tools or parts I come up with for the GP100s in the future. The shooting season's coming up, and I have ammo to load and practices to get to, so time to get to editing. Thanks for watching, and I will see you soon.